This is The Open Ears Project. My name is Dexter Filkins, and I'm a staff writer for The New Yorker. For many years, I was a foreign correspondent for The New York Times. And for four years, nearly four years, I lived in Baghdad during the war there. This is the second movement of Ravel's Piano Concerto in G Major. I used to put it on uh, in the nightmare years of the war in Iraq from 2003 to 2007. journalist in Iraq was a very strange experience. I, ne- I never got used to the coming and going, but it was, I mean, I hated going, but I hated leaving. You know, we live in a strange world uh, where uh, you can get on an airplane and fly to another planet, essentially what amounts to another planet, stay there for a while and come back. It was a really, really hard time, incredibly violent. I would go out some days and there would be uh, 10 or 15 car bombings and suicide bombings. I mean, pretty much every day for the space of a couple of years. There'd be 50 bodies in the streets every morning in their last kind of terrible poses with their bags over their heads and their hands cuffed behind them, having been taken away by some death squad the night before. I mean, it was insane. We were just a newspaper trying to figure out what was going on out there. But it was easy to um, it was easy to go to pieces, and it was easy to kind of lose your faith and and everything. And I used to come back sometimes, and I would I would put on the second movement of Ravel's Piano Concerto in G, just to just to take it in. so gentle, but there's an undercurrent of tension there, which I think grows through the movement, and where I think it begins to feel, as tender as it is, that you're walking on a nerve. And I think that's what makes it so powerful because it's that feeling that kind of uh, of the storm receding and going out to sea and not quite gone and still blustery and blowing and spooky but the storm is gone the pain is gone it's all temporary but of course so is this so is this moment Um, it would uh, it would calm me in those in those really really bad moments during those terrible days that that I had there. And I remember it was a very particular phenomenon uh, in the bad years, which was 
Most of the car bombs and most of the suicide bombings would happen before 9 o'clock in the morning. We were living on a crazy schedule because of the time difference. We would stay up until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and then inevitably 8.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, you'd start to hear the blasts. And there were days when our walls would shake pretty much every day and the windows were blown out several times, but typically what would happen is I'd hear a big blast and I'd run out the door. And I remember one in particular was very close to the house, it was just about a block away. It was a girl's school and they had bombed the building next door. I still remember running towards the scene and you could see the fire and the smoke. And the girls in their uniforms, their little blue skirts and their white shirts, just, you know, eyes wide, mouths open, just running away. And uh, that was a really bad day, but I remember literally wading in, in the rubble. And there were family members looking for, looking for their children, or looking for their mother, or looking for their, for their brother, and, and grieving, wailing. They're just impossible scenes. And uh, it, that kind of thing stays with you, and it doesn't go away. And I remember those, those scenes, uh, the grieving mothers. And it, there's nothing to say about it. Um, but I feel like this music speaks to that. It speaks to the suffering. It speaks to the suffering going away. And it speaks to that tenderness that comes after. And uh, I still, God, I still think of those days. Thinking about them right now. I would often wonder and still do what it was that Ravel himself was trying to convey. Ravel himself had been, I think he was a driver in the First World War and had a number of friends, I think, who'd been kind of shattered by, by the experience, but I feel like this comes right out of that. It must. I feel like he certainly understood in his way um, exactly what it feels like to go through that. I think he had to, he had to suffer to get to this. You can feel it. The funny thing about war is you see the whole human condition laid out in front of you every day. And it, it's the human condition in extremis. I mean, it's under kind of really intense circumstances. And so as much utter barbarity and incredible stupidity and uh, terrible suffering I saw, you also see people really at their best and at their strongest and their most noble. People running into burning cars and pulling people out and uh, people just enduring what they were enduring. And so, in that way, it's not a hopeless endeavor to witness that. Part of the power of this piece is that, um, as clear as it is that there had been enormous pain before it, it's not hopeless. In a way, it feels redemptive. You feel like you're coming out of something. Pain is leaving, the storm is leaving, and what's left is, you know, the human heart. When I listen to this piece today, it feels like the world's gonna be okay. That was Dexter Filkins. He chose the adagio from Maurice Ravel's Piano Concerto in G. Stay with us. The adagio's coming up. Thank you. 
This is The Open Ears Project. Join us next week. We've got Bach and Rowan Williams. Music connects a lot with the unpeeling or unrolling of that tight little ball inside that's my ego, my worried, frantic, guilty, ambitious ego. The Open Ears Project was conceived and created by Clemency Burton Hill. I'm Terence McKnight, and I'm so pleased to present season two of this podcast to you. If you like what you hear, please leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you've got a story about a piece of classical music, we want to know. Email us at openears at wqxr.org. You can also head to our website, wqxr.org, to check out our other podcast about classical music and playlists for this and past season. Season two of The Open Ears Project was produced by Clemency Burton Hill and Rosa Gollin. Our technical director is Sapir Rosenblatt, and our project manager is Natalia Ramirez. Elizabeth Nonamaker is the executive producer of podcasts at WQXR, and Ed Yim is our chief content officer. I'm Terrence McKnight. Thanks so much for listening.